So we're going to listen. I'm going to call three names and we're going to hear them testify. So first is Ifure Emmanuel. Next is Glory Esien and Edopese John. Ifure Emmanuel, Glory Esien and Edopese John. So Sister Ifure. Um, I titled my testimony, Beautiful in Its Time. I was down with severe malaria about last three weeks, almost four now. And it lasted for about six to seven days. It was so bad that I was more or less confined to my bed and the room. Except when I had to bath or eat, which I could not really do. That is the eating. So prior to that, I had been feeling quite stressed. So I'm a bit nervous. I've been feeling quite stressed because, well, I was actively working. And though I enjoyed my job, really. But it's not what you would call an easy job. And of course, there were responsibilities in the house. So I live at the man's pastor's house and I have some responsibilities there. So after quite a long while, it all began to take a toll on me and I was stressed. So yes, I admit there were days where I experienced the supernatural or divine strength of God at work. And I'm actually grateful for those days. But there were also days where I was feeling really very tired. And um, some of those times I will actually voice out like, oh, I'm tired, I'm tired. And at a point I felt like I just need to go away, take a break. Now, I do not mean go away from the Lord or God's lighthouse. That thought has not crossed my mind before because I enjoy every time spent in the fellowship of brethren, the amazing teaching of pastor, and even the time I spent with God personally, it was all very enjoyable for me. So that's never crossed my mind. But I was, you know, different point, thought to cross my mind, let me just go away from the man, leave work for a while to just go to a place where it's just me and the Lord. You know how you watch some, you know, cartoons or animations. I watch animations sometimes and you see how somebody is feeling oh no 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 and they go to a cave where they are all alone in one mountain so those pictures at times run through my mind but one of the things I've learned over time in the Lord's dealing with me is not to run when things are hard for you never know what those hard times are shaping or preparing you for and sometimes nothing reveals the state of your heart to you better than times of pressure and these are the things that we pray for lord search my heart search my heart and when god begins to shake us put us give us a lot of responsibilities that seem to put us under pressure we try to run away from it because god's answer is not the way you would have liked it to be i also learned that as a disciple emphasis on disciple things do not just happen by accident so many times we are not in the places we are at the times that we are just because we want to. But God that knows the different kind of weather that various plants will blossom on. He knows the different places and under what circumstances that the things is working out in our lives will be performed. So when the thought of just leave, just go, simultaneously this question will follow. But is it the will of God for you at this time? Would you prefer to run away from this class than meet it later on? One of the things I'm really very scared of, one of the restraints in my life, in all my decisions is I'm scared of going out of the will of God. I'm scared of repeating a class when I should have been flying. That's when I'm now running. Or when I should be running, that's when I'm walking. That's one of the restraints in my life. And it will help us if we have that kind of fear. I think it's a good fear. So on several occasions in my heart, I don't think I ever said it out. I mean, my angel should not come and hear something like that. So in my heart, I, I said, oh, I wish I would just fall ill. So that I would just lie on the bed and rest. Like 
it's it's got to that point because I felt not just stress in my body, my mind as well. But be careful what you wish for because if you should get what you wish, would you like what you get? You know how at times we feel like, you know how a child sees something like an ice cream and the parent, as a, the parent of the child might, might have tasted that ice cream and they're crying, daddy, mommy, give me this ice cream. I want this ice cream. And the mother said, it's not what you think, oh, or maybe not ice cream because ice cream on our mind is very sweet. Let's look for maybe a drink that is bitter, but the color is very attractive. And the child say, mommy, I want to test, I want to test. You know how when the child <laughs> gets that drink, then drinks it and begins to say, mommy, I think you can help me to finish it because it's not, it's not what they expected. So these were the things going on in the background. So last three weeks when I took ill, I did not intend to take medications. Even when auntie, that is pastor's wife, asked if she should get medications from me, I said no after contemplating for a while. And I told her that I think I just needed to rest for a few days and I'll be fine. And truly, that was what I thought. But I did not get fine. I got worse. The fever, the headaches, the weakness, loss of appetite, loss of weight. It almost felt like I actually would never be strong again. And at a point, I was thinking, what if the whole of this December, I'm just on the bed? Hey, Jesus. Sorry. So when the sickness persisted and got worse, by the third or fourth day, I can't remember exactly, I had a feeling that this was not normal. Something else was behind this. So I, I asked the Lord. I did not fast for three days, though. I simply asked. I said, Lord, why am I sick for this long? And almost immediately, I heard the Holy Spirit said, is this not what you wished for? I was strongly reminded of the times I wished in my heart to be ill so I could rest. Imagine such foolishness. So I prayed asking God to forgive me. Now, I had succumbed to taking medicine on the second or third day. So on the sixth day, though my health had obviously improved, but not completely, I was still ill. So pastor came home from Bethel, Ibiam. He had been on a work retreat with the writers. So he came home to sort out one or two things. And he had been informed that I was ill. So auntie told me that pastor said he's going to pray for me. So I went to meet him in the study. I was stronger now than previous days so I could get up. But he told me to go back to the room. He would come and pray for me. Now, when pastor came, he laid down on my head and prayed. And this is what he said. I remit your sins. In my mind, I'm like, sir, with sins, I'm not falling, no. You know that kind of that kind of things. So he said, I remit your sin. Father, forgive her. Forgive her for inordinate speaking, even words that were spoken in ignorance. Now note, I had not told anyone what the Holy Spirit had revealed to me about the cause of my lengthy illness. So how did pastor know? Pastor did not pray. This was what he said. Like he did not pray. Eh. <laughs> God is amazing, people. So how did he know that the Spirit of God that searches all things? Now, Pastor's prayer was both a comfort and a confirmation because when the Holy Spirit told me that, you know how, at times I was saying, ah, it's my mind. No, 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 it's not the cause. It's just the stress. But the Spirit keeps saying, it's the one. It's the one. So Pastor came to confirm it. Now, I'm thanking God for the healing, of course. But what's more important to me or what I'm more grateful for are the lessons that I knew, but from this experience, it was more engrafted in my heart. And the first one is, um, you know, Proverbs 18, 20, 21. A man's stomach shall be satisfied by the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of the lips, his lips, it shall be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. Those who love it will eat its fruit thereof. Then, 1 Samuel 16, 17. Not reading it out, but it's the place where Samuel was about to choose a king from amongst the sons of Jesse. I'm rushing because of time. And the Lord told him simply that I do not judge by the outward. I look at the heart. So the words our heart speaks are louder than the words spoken by our lips to God. It was a simple wish I made in my heart, yet God heard it. So let's watch it. 
So your, you know how at times you can grumble, complain, say all you want in your heart. Somewhere in your mind tells you, well, that's still acceptable after I did not say it out. Nobody can say I said it out. Sorry. Nobody can say I said it out. The devil cannot use that against me or something like that. Life and death are in the power of the tongue. Speak light. Words are spirit, but not all words are life. Only the words of Jesus is life. So when you speak the words of Jesus, you speak life. But when you speak the words of, you know, your flesh, the words of your emotions, it can be death. Then Ecclesiastes 3.11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, he has put eternity in, our, in their hearts, except that no one can find out the work that God does from beginning to end. It's easier to bear our yokes when we have learned to be content and accept the time that God is taking us through. So I remember about this. There was a time long ago when I had told my shepherd, that Ma, this, 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 this. So I feel so overwhelmed. And she told me that when she prayed, what she simply heard was, I think it was Jacob's prophecy or Moses' prophecy when they were blessing the 12 tribes of Israel, where it says, and Issachar bent his back and bore his burden. She said that was what she heard. She did not tell me any city. She just told me that, bend your back and bear that yoke. Carry that cross. It's for a time. I had even spoken to pastor too. And you know, pastor answered in two lines. Pastor said, it's for a time and it's for a season. Ask God for wisdom to order your responsibilities. So you see how you're looking for small consolation from here, but when God is training you. So it was easier to rejoice, and I usually felt stronger. Any day I do not grumble in my heart or my mouth, it's actually happened. So complaining and grumbling weakens your strength because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And when you complain and grumble, you lose your joy. Automatically, you lose spiritual strength. When you lose spiritual strength, if you are a disciple, it tends to affect you physically as well. Then God makes all things beautiful in its proper time. Do not just quit that job or leave that house because you feel under pressure. Check it out with God. Is it time? Or instead of it being beautiful, it could turn out to be ugly. So I'm grateful to God for this. I'm grateful to God because now I have more reasons to bend my back and bear my cross. I have more reasons to, to just go through the time and season of my life. It's not forever, but allow God's work to be completely done in me. May God's name be praised. I'm glorious here. So I'll be reading out my testimony. But before now, before then rather, I'm thanking God because he has been Faithful. So on Friday, Bob Bernard had said we should testify to two minutes, everyone. And I was supposed to testify this testimony on Friday, but I felt ah, I did not arrange it. So let me arrange it, but it's fine. And I also felt that I denied God that day because I didn't give him glory because I was feeling I, I would have gathered it very well. But now I'm repenting and I'm asking for God for mercy. So my testimony. I'm thanking God for soul healing. This healing came through forgiveness. I don't know where to start, but let me start from here. While my dad was alive, there was a cordial relationship between my, own, my uncles, guys, my nuclear family and the extended family. My dad accommodated many of my relatives and met most, some of their needs as well. This was no longer so after the dismiss of my dad. My uncles de deserted us, and those who were once close family were nowhere to be found. I grew up to discover this, and my sisters made it a duty to always remind me that hmm, we don't have uncles, so those ones are just there. They're not uncles, they're human beings. Like in mockery, like we don't have uncles, so we don't have anyone, basically. We don't have people around us. On many occasions where I needed help, I couldn't get it from some uncles and some other relatives. This was a time I, there was, okay, sorry. There was a time I needed financial assistance because I wanted writing YA again. I had, I had a D7 in the last one I wrote and I called one of my mom's brother who was well to do. So I thought, and he told me he can't help me or that I, and I, 
then I needed a huge amount of money to commence the registration process. And I was like, even if it's 5K, like, I went as slow as 5K because I needed a big amount of money. He said, no, you can't help me. That was the response. This response got to me and I nurtured some kind of hatred for him. And before now, my sisters had been telling me, okay, I said it before, that we don't have uncles. That I should just know that and know peace. So basically, in, dis in discussions that involves many friends, telling me about what their uncle did, what their uncle said, looking like their uncle had a say in their lives, I'll be like, huh? Please permit me to say, I'll be like, they're no bond that uncle well. Like, you see how you be like, your uncle said, I should not do this. My uncle said, I should not. So, just, <laughs> so, I, so I did not grow up with those kind of issues or situations, how would I put it? Now, I grew up with the mindset that no one cares about you and don't even know your name. I don't know their name either. Now, how did my healing come? So early last year, February, I was reading a book by Benny Hinn, Benny Hinn, titled Good Morning, Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brought this particular uncle to mind, the one that refused helping me. I remember crying profusely I, because it seemed he was going through a lot and he needed my prayers. But I wasn't willing to because of the hurt in my heart. I remember fighting the thoughts like, no, I'm not going to, like, I don't want to forgive him. I, I don't, I'm not willing. I, I, I don't want. I don't want. I don't want to hear. I'm trying to shut the Holy Spirit. So then I remember what my shepherd had told me because I had told her about it. And she said I should forgive. I repented and I asked God to forgive him. I prayed for him. I literally said, Lord, I forgive Uncle Samson. I love him. And I, I kept repeating that word unto you. Now, when, he, when, when they come to mind, I forced myself to say it. So it becomes part of me. Like I forced myself to try to forgive before now. So I got my healing. Now when it comes to mind, I pray in the spirit and past. There, there was no iota of bitterness inside me anymore. And before I forgot, before, before when it comes to mind, I'll be like, okay, ch okay, child, there's one uncle like that too. So. He's like, he's, they are not, no, nobody to me, especially this particular uncle. Because of that little thing, as if, I felt I, I was your right or something. So that's one healing. And another one is, I'm also thanking God for another healing. So this one is part of my life testimony. When I was in year one, there was this staff that helped me out in school. My school runs afterwards. He told me that we should sit out at, we should sit out. He pointed at the place. And I followed cowardly. As I was, I did not know what it really meant to sit up and accepted, and we went. That's how this man carried me inside the hotel room unknowingly. Believe me, unknowingly. I did not know. I was thinking, ah, there is another place after this place. No, it was an hotel room. And there was no, and inside this hotel room, he had locked the door. I was wondering what is happening. And he wanted to rape me. There was no amount of tears I did not share. I shed a lot of that. I was crying, pleading him because I did not know what to do. And I told God, if he delivered me from this one like this, I will serve him. <laughs> I was crying like, sir, please. I, I said, ah, it's not me. It, it's not you that followed me here. <laughs> I don't know now. Now, how I left there without that man sleeping with me, I don't know. I don't know. But all I know is that God came through for me. The man just walked to the door after my pleading and pleading and crying. He walked to the door, opened the door because he had locked it, and I left crying. Maybe tears of joy. Even when I left, I was still crying. I don't know why I was crying, but I was crying because I was free. <laughs> and, I was, and I was happy. I was like, child, God can answer prayer like this. Eh? I cried till I met me at Edikan, so I walked back to my hostel. And I met Edikan, Edikan Obot. I knew him from the same fellowship, heavenly minded. He talked, he spoke about last time he testified at home. That is where I met him. And when I met when I saw him come, I started cleaning my tears. I said, oh God, dude. <laughs> I said, no, I didn't want to that. Why are you crying? But that was when I met him and invited me to church. So people of God, I won't share everything now. It's part of my life testimony. So stay, stay tuned.
everything, everything, don't worry. How did my healing come? The thought of this always got me pain because I still see the man in campus. So I confessed to my shepherd about it and she, she had said I should forgive him again. Hmm. The thought of having to forgive him and also asking God to forgive him was so even more painful. It was easy, but it wasn't easy, rather. It wasn't easy, but I had to, and I did, and I became so light almost immediately. I had people of God, remember that, that my uncle did this thing. This thing happened in 2020, that my uncle that refused, that was just there. And last month, December, I just received a call from him. I didn't have that number. And I was, I, I was not hearing, so I was wondering, I beg who be this. He ended the call and sent me a message almost immediately on WhatsApp. I said I should send my account number. I said, okay, I sent. I said, no, I was saying first. And immediately he sent me money. Unexpectedly. That was this part of my unexpected money testimony. And I was grateful, like, how? There is no, how are you? How have you been? He just sent me a message, send me your account number. And I'm grateful to God for for all those things. And anytime it comes to mind, this for this testimony, anytime it comes to mind, anytime the thought of what happened crossed my mind then, like the thought of this man I met in campus, anytime the thought of what happened crossed my mind then, I used to feel pain, you know, but as now, I am grateful that God has relieved me of the pain and hurt and had given me grace to forgive him. I am grateful to God for all this major, major healing and for more healings over the years I've been in God's lighthouse. May his name be praised. Amen. Okay, my name is Edo Besser John. So, <clears throat> I'm very happy. So, let me just be, so that I'll not be diverting. So I'm thanking God for his goodness and mercy that he's been showing upon the life of a young girl and a young boy that I have been ministering to at the hospital. So the young boy got discharged about two days ago, and the young girl is recovering very amazingly. So first, Destiny George. I recall when we first prayed for him um, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit as a as a boy that grew up in, like, you know, a Church of Christ boy, it was difficult for him at first to believe and receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But eventually, when he did, it was amazing. Now, I remember the next time I went to visit him after he got baptized in the Holy Spirit, I wasn't expecting the reverse of questions about the baptism of the Holy Spirit, who is the Holy Spirit, all those questions, basically, that he directed at me. And... Okay, before this day, I recall that earlier that week he had called and asked me um, questions. Okay, for context, the boy is 17 years old. So he asked me questions about the Holy Spirit um, during that week. And I had to try and explain many things. He kept on having so many questions. So I told him, don't worry, I'm going to come and visit you again. So on the day I went to visit him, he just poured his questions on me. And it's like... It took hours answering all the questions he had. He would ask me, okay, so, because, okay, that day I had given him, I left him with um, 1 Corinthians 14 to study, like, pending when I'm going to come and visit him in the hospital. So, when I got to the hospital that day, he started asking me questions, like, okay, so that day you were praying for me, and I heard you and your partner praying in tongues. Why did you not explain what we were praying? You know, um, 1 Corinthians 14, that talks about um, that you shouldn't, that it's better to speak a thousand words in English than to, um, sorry, to speak few words in English than to speak a thousand words in tongues if you are not going to interpret. So he asked me, and hey, it was like a war. Now, this boy is baptized in the Holy Spirit, but he cannot still believe it. So he's asking all these questions. Anyway, so I, I think I spent hours that day. I left that place around 8 or 9 p.m. that day. And he still had more questions. So I told him I'll come back again. Now, it's been over a month now since um, um, I started going to talk to him and all of that. So, <clears throat> so yesterday, after I heard he had been discharged, so he told me that they'll be leaving the hospital. So I went to go and see him. And he was telling me a lot of things about what's been going on and asking questions as usual. Okay, I had... I made him start studying the Bible. I gave him, I didn't have a hard copy Bible to give him, but I gave him the soft copy one and he was reading and reading and 
all of that. So yesterday he he told me that that um that he has a question. So why is it that that he has this problem that whenever he because he, he according to him he usually gathers the small children in the hospital in the morning to pray. So he told me that whenever he's praying. That even when he's praying in English, all of them are always telling him to stop and pray in English, that he's praying in tongues, that they cannot understand what he's saying. So it was after well, I wanted to start explaining, then it now dawned on me that this is the manifestation of the interpretation of tongues because he's hearing himself. Like, he, you know how in your mind, you know you're praying in English, but what's coming out is, is tongues. So, and he said it has been happening, and so he's confused. I had to explain to him about all of that, and he was still giving me this look of doubt, like, are you sure? Anyways, but I'm just happy that, first of all, that he has gotten to the place where he's fine, like, he's fine enough to be discharged, because he would call me many times, and he would complain that they are still fine, that uh, the doctors will come, and they will come and see a particular percentage of protein, because I think he, he had kidney issues, I don't really know, but he, he was swollen, so he had lost the swelling and all, but though his cheeks were still swollen and stuff, but the problem that kept him in the hospital for the remaining um, weeks was that they kept on finding protein in his urine, during urinalysis. So, um, so as I yesterday, he told me that it was zero when he came to check. So I'm thanking God for that because God has been so good. And he's going to be traveling to Delta State and... So I got him a Bible study notebook and a vision book. So he was so excited. I kept on telling him, you have to write down your dreams. Now this boy, he's having dreams and it's coming to pass. Like, you know how you dream that money and it happens during the day. So I remember when we, the first time we prayed for him and he told us that, oh, that he used to have dreams, but his sister says that it's malaria, that, he, that whatever it is he's seeing is not true because of the, uh, maybe the Church of Christ background or something. So I, I encouraged him and we prayed for him more that day so he would have visions. According to him, he said that it's, he, he, it is his mind, imagination, like he's imagining things. Then he did not come and play out a few minutes after. And I, so I was like, well, brother, calm down. This thing is called a CI gifting, a prophetic. He told me, hmm, okay. So the point is, I'm just, I'm just happy because God has been amazing. Not only did he just bless him like spiritually and stuff, also physically, the boy has a reason to not go like, eh, God only knows how to bless people. When you say the goodness of God, is it only in spiritual things? Can't it also be physical? Can't he heal me and stuff? So I'm, I'm grateful to God that he is working in his life. And so yesterday the boy asked me um, that he wants to know what his calling in this world is. Like, why did God call him to this world? I'm like, ah, brother, calm down. <laughs> we haven't even started your proper Bible study. And he's like, but I'm just happy for the fire that I'm seeing in him. And I'm praying that the fire will not burn out as he's traveling in Jesus' name. So moving over to the girl that I was talking about. So the first time I met this girl, I think it was in May. Either, no, not May. Okay, I think about July or August, about that, I'm not really sure. But I remember when I met the girl, my friend's baby was in the hospital that, that season. So I saw the girl and I asked, what's wrong with her? And the, um, her mom told me, oh, that the doctor gave her an overdose. And so it paralyzed her. So the, I think the girl is about five years old or so. So she was just there. She couldn't see. She couldn't talk. She can't move. Like, just know when someone is paralyzed, but it was just bad. When I saw her, my first reaction was like, oh, this girl is going to die. I'm picking it. But then I heard the Holy Spirit rebuke me like, who, who gave you the authority or who gave you the right to make such pronouncements over somebody's life? But I left because I prayed for her that day, but without any faith whatsoever that she didn't get better. And I left. So when I left, weeks after, the Holy Spirit was still on my, my mind, like, go back and visit so I had dragged for a while, and then I was like, well, I might go back, and, and she's dead, Sha. So, but when I went, I saw the girl, and she was still alive. I was so happy. So, but that day, I felt like a fool, because I don't know what to say to the mom. She was just looking at me. So I stood there, and I just started talking about different things. But still, I wasn't feeling the, I don't know. But I still prayed for her again, and I left still again without faith. But this time, I went, went with, when I went to Stanley, Eddie Watts, and at that time, because... And we prayed, and he prayed, and we got all sorts of words for her. We had seen, okay, now her condition was not improving. Up, they, they had been in the hospital since, I think, June. 
and her condition wasn't getting better. So everyone was like, mm, we are still just giving treatment, so hopefully nothing was changing. So I remember that day when we prayed and we had gotten all sorts of words and we told the mom, she prayed, she repented, different things. She had mentioned how um, she knew that God had called her to children's ministry, but she wasn't obeying and all of that. So I told her stories of how, oh, because of certain disobedience, God can actually bring you to a place where you'll be able to obey. But even in that hospital, she would hear the Holy Spirit tell her to lead in morning devotions, and but she was just soaked in her own pain and misery, so she would not obey and different things like that. So we prayed with her, and I remember when we prayed with her, I had heard three, um, three times that, you know, uh, when the Bible says, is it a time? A time and half a time, that kind of thing. But when I heard it, I heard three times, and I wondered, did it mean three months? Did it mean a season? Again, to tell the truth, I was not, I didn't have faith, but I think my partner, Stan Lady, was had so much faith that day. So I was just there, and he, so he, a lot of, a lot of things happened, which I don't want to go through, but, so, but we had seen visions, I, I, I particularly, I had seen a vision where an angel, um, three angels, like, placed her on a, on a stretcher and rolled her into a theater room and, and they were about to start conducting surgery on her. But before that, they had started putting all sorts of protective um, gears on her body. So I wondered what that represented until later when her mom um, spoke about how different nurses, that she had noticed weird movements, like people, all sorts of people coming and trying to lay hands on her child. Not as per Christians trying to pray, you know, people, they are witches, occultic people, all sorts of people. So that there was a particular woman that she literally had to outrightly rebuke that she should never come close to her daughter again because she was wondering a lot of things. So I just felt, oh, maybe an attack was going to come on the girl. So that's why all of those things were happening. Now, this girl was looking dry. Just picture how someone looks like, should I say, not bonga fish, forgive me, but really dry. She, she, there was no improvement whatsoever. And she was being fed through her nose, different things. But yes, not yesterday. I start, I, as, as I kept going, I noticed things were changing on her body, but you know how you're like, well, let's just watch you. But yes, this one really make me, made me to be happy because I went and I saw the girl and she did not look like the person we had prayed for a month ago. She was looking all fleshy. Her skin was glowing. Like, I cannot explain it. And then she's able to see now. She can smile. She's making sounds like she wants to talk. She's no longer crying excessively as she used to, because before, she, I don't know what was wrong, but she was constantly in pain. So they used to give her drugs to, like, to suppress her pain or just make her to sleep. And most times she would come out from that sleep and continue in crying. It was just bad. I just wondered how miserable she was, but now she can see, she's happy. She, like, you, she would look at you and smile. It's a smile that almost broke my heart. I almost cried, but I don't allow it to show. But... I, I saw her smile. I'm like, she's smiling now. The mom was like, yes, yeah, she's getting better. Even the nurses were like, yes, she's recovering really fast. And, and we are so happy. We believe she'll be out soon. So I just want to thank God. Tell God, thank you for all he's doing. That I did not, I did not just stop at my pessimistic uh, tendency of saying, that girl is going to die. Let's just leave it. I feel like there's this prophetic knowing. You know, I just want to thank God that God has helped her, and I believe that, hopefully, I want to believe that that three times meant in three months. So I'm, I'm looking at February, you know, March. Let's see. But I, I thank God for this. May God name be praised in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're going to um, hear from two people again. We have two testifiers, Samuel Otaka and Etim Bogokun. Please um, try to stick to time. All right. I, I'm Samuel Otaka. I want to thank God for um, the ability to have dreams again and to see visions again. Okay, so some of us here may not remember 2020 when Pastor mentioned, you know, I think that was the prayer marathon season where I was not very faithful with sending in my words. And Pastor prayed a strong prayer. Yes, I was affected. Because it seemed like I was in a dry place for two years. And SO disappeared from prophetic words in the hall and different places. 
So, okay, I just, I've come to thank God because you know how, I remember there was a season in 2021 where Pastor made a very strong prayer again, but this time in the positive, and he said something about um, how that the devil's time for to afflict, you know, when you are a lawful captive, the devil's time to afflict can, um, should have come to an end, but he still leverages on your ignorance. Yeah, you know, with the story of the Israelites and the people of the tribe of Judah in, in Babylon and all of that, if there was no Daniel to understand by the books, the times to pray. So at that time, this was two years now. I mean, I should have come out of that thing, but I, I just got comfortable with not seeing and not dreaming and all of that. I will have, you know, I remember when I shared the testimony of uh, NCCF, how I got to, I had to pray that prayer. If you remember the words I made, I put together, I said, God, please answer me beyond reasonable doubt that I should take up this office in NCCF because I, I was used to not dreaming. So for God to give me a dream that night, it was a big deal. I took it as a very great confirmation. So whenever I would dream for that period, it would be a very, very important thing for me. That's how I, I, I came to take it. So um, 2022 should have been the end of two years now, but throughout last year, I mean, I would have, my dream book was almost empty, you know, very sparse spaces in between. Okay, the testimony is this, that um, on the 25th of December, when pastor prayed for people, you know, he first called out people that are leaders in different um, units and all of that. I don't know why I felt contention to come out. However, I did come out for, in my head for accommodation, you know, units and all of that. So I came out and pastor just touched my head. I was like, you saw how he prayed for other people. I was like, pastor, why? <laughs> But that's what touch, okay? I mean, I think I've had dreams almost every day in, since then. And detailed dreams, things I can remember, I can, um, I can remember, I can write down, I can record, I can still remember some days after. It's a big deal. I didn't used to remember my dreams. So even when I dream, sometimes when I wake up, I won't be able to remember them. Okay, so that's a very, very, very massive testimony for me. Because there are lots of things. I mean, I dream about office. I dream about colleagues. I dream about brethren. I can't remember the last time I dreamed about you guys. <laughs> it's not a joke. I mean, I remember people in my dreams and I see people and I ah, no, it's a big deal for me. So I want to return all glory to God for that. Praise God. Good evening, everyone. Okay, so I'll be sharing a bit of my life testimony. I'll just read what I have here early years, basically. We did not go to church when I was much younger. Sunday was a rest day for us, and we gathered as a family to do other things. One particular Sunday, a lady who we called Auntie Maria came over. She asked us how church was, and we said we did not go to church. I guess she just assumed it just happened that Sunday only. As God will have it, she came over the next Sunday and asked the same question. And we, the children, gave the same answer. She was surprised and asked why. We responded that we did not usually go to church. She was really concerned and had a conversation with my mom that she should be allowed to take us to church. And my mom agreed. She attended the Deeper Life Church close to my house and came to get us every Sunday. Initially, I was the most rebellious <laughs> because she basically upset the balance of our life. But as time passed, I became the most committed out of my siblings. She would take me for their conferences. Now I remember I would have to sleep on benches and I was so young. This was before I got into secondary school, if I recall correctly. Getting into secondary school, I gave my life to Christ and had a beautiful relationship with the Lord. My, my relationship with God formed the basis of my being a principled and disciplined person. Everything good attributed to me had its foundation in my knowledge of Christ. I joined the discipleship group. My, my school had a discipleship group. I even forgot I was ever in the discipleship and taught Bible study as I grew. So what caused me to walk away from the Lord? 
There was a program organized in my secondary school then, and there was a prayer call for the infilling of the Holy Spirit. I did not, um, I did not speak in tongues, though in hindsight, I think I got filled at that, um, if, at that program. But because I didn't speak in tongues, I actually thought I did not get filled. And the preacher had said that if one did not speak in tongues, they were not filled. I saw people who, by my assessment, were not as righteous as I was, get filled and try to hold on to faith for some days and kept coming to him in prayers. Days after, I became angry at God as to why I do not get filled and started pulling away from everything. I left the discipleship and stopped teaching Bible study. I just became focused on my academics. I still prayed and all, but my heart was no longer committed because I felt God did not come true for me. The summary of my life is you cannot be morally upright outside of God. The lines I proposed not to cross, which were based on what I had understood from scriptures, I crossed, and the ones I didn't, given time and the right circumstances, I would have crossed them. My first, <laughs> my first email address, <laughs> sorry. My first email address was born out of my resolve to prove there can be a balance to being a princess, which was a picture of the moral principled and disciplined me and the me that wanted to have fun. There's no balance, my people. <laughs> because I had thought I was all that, I was all I was by my sheer will and just being a strong woman who knew what she wanted. But this year, Though I had realized it much earlier, it has been reaffirmed that I'm not a strong woman. And I found myself saying, I am not a strong woman, help me, Lord. My anger towards God opened me up to accept and compromise on a lot of things. It started little by little. So I did not wear trousers out of all my sisters and my gowns were all long. <laughs> this was due to what I had believed with regards to the matter. So I had limited knowledge on the matter at that time. But based on the knowledge I had, I had made certain stands, right? All my siblings wore trousers. They had earrings on and stuff. Well, my earrings is not due to all of that. I just don't like earrings. I told my mom to buy me trousers and she too was shocked because <laughs> I had a very strong stand on the things I believed and was vocal about them. I started painting my nails and making hairs I previously did not do. Now we all know wearing trousers and making your hair with attachments is not wrong. But with the knowledge I had at the time, it was, it was me just acting in rebellion, right? Then other things happened to me. I got into pornography, masturbation, drinking, clubbing, had depression, was in bondage to fear and anxiety, had crazy anger outbursts, <laughs> suicidal thoughts, and so much more. I have shared a bit on the fear part on the whole, but I will focus on the drinking today. So this is focused on drinking and life of clubbing, basically. This began when I had gone out of the country to study. I wondered when I was younger why people would drink to drown their sorrows and felt they were not wise people. <laughs> so how did mine start? A girl had come into my school from the UK and she was really beautiful. For some weird reason, the, my big sister instinct kicked in to protect her from the roaring lions that were the boys in my school. I actually thought she was innocent. One day she said she wanted to go out to the club and it was boring at home. And I wondered why a club, but as I did not want her to go alone, I went with her. This was my first time in the club. We got there and she fusses again and that she wants to drink, but does not like drinking alone. <laughs> I really don't know why I did not just drag her away and go home. After much back and forth, I had a drink with her. We had tequila shots and this became my drink of choice. I wondered after taking it that I felt nothing. So why do people get drunk on this? <laughs> okay, I can say this is probably due to my lineage in hindsight. So I'm from Oran and Oran men are known for drinking. <laughs> <laughs> uh, sorry. Um, 
And this was one of the reasons my mom's family didn't want my parents getting married. But knowing my dad didn't drink helped his case. Dick's experience made me feel drinking was not so bad. It just depended on the person, and that night ended. Now, there was an annual event that happened where everyone would gather from one end. Okay, so I was in Hungary for a bit. So there's an event that happens there. Um, everyone gathers at one end of the city center, and we drink from one bar to the other till we get to the end, the other end of the city center. Free drinks, yeah. So I've n I had not gone for that event before. <laughs> I'm sorry. There are a lot of bars, and you are likely to be drunk before getting halfway if you drank in all the bars. So the girl from UK said she wanted to attend it, and knowing the things that happened at the event, I really didn't want to leave her by herself. Drunk people. So the day after, drunk people will be seen on the ground, like you wake up on the ground, guy. Saturday morning, it was crazy, yeah. So some it was not safe for her to go alone, especially as a young lady. Up until meeting her, if I remember correctly, my routine was school, home, and sometimes restaurants because I like to eat. But this association introduced me to a life of drinking, house parties, and clubbing. When I got back to Nigeria, I stopped doing that for a while. So I'd stop drinking. There's something that happens to your brain when you come back to Nigeria. <laughs> and then your parents are so close, so you know that you can't be unwise. But then my friends came back to Nigeria. So and I was schooling in Abuja at the time, and we met up. I told them I didn't drink anymore. I remember that night. <laughs> I told them I didn't drink anymore. And this was on our way out to like a lounge. And I told him, I didn't, uh, people, I don't drink anymore. And there was this silence. And then there was this outburst of laughter. And then silence again. And we just went, we just moved on like I didn't say anything. Brethren, when we got to the lounge that day, I was the main consumer of the alcohol. And I was wasted that night. I, I drank more than everybody. This began a new level of drinking because I had some restraint because um, my parent, when I was, okay, let me just read what I have here. I had some restraint on the extent of alcohol I drank while outside because I was in another man's land. Now, this is not to say I didn't get drunk outside the country. I could no longer take drinks. So I, I still got drunk outside of the country, but you, there were specific places and all of that. So you still be cautious, right? And all of that. But coming to Nigeria, being able to get drunk while in Nigeria gave me a whole new level of boldness. I could no longer take drinks except they had alcohol in them. During the holidays, I couldn't take soft drinks at home. So my parents would drive usually buy drinks and keep at home, soft drinks, malt, all those stuff. I would say I just drink water, but that I don't like all of the... They just thought I didn't like those drinks, but that was not the whole truth. I just couldn't drink them. I would leave school to party, so my school didn't have any restriction. I could leave school at 2 a.m. and I would be back. So there was no coffee. You could leave at any time and be back at any time. I was particular about this while picking the university. I was going to school in Nigeria because I was coming from a place of freedom and I was not about to be caged by any school restrictions. It is why I refused to attend Covenant University like my siblings. NYC began and my mind at this point had a lot going on. Story for another day. That particular day, I planned to leave work go to the supermarket, buy a drink, and party by myself at home. Now, in all my drinking and getting drunk, I didn't bring liquor home. I only drank when I was out, but to make a plan, buy liquor and bring it home, that was another level I was entering. Crossing that line would make it easier to keep crossing it. Prior to this day, I had been won by the boy God was using to reach out to me to stop drinking, so he had told me, to stop drinking. And I had ignored the warning because at that time I was offended at him. <laughs> I had panic attacks. So I used to have panic attacks. 
And I had learned to control it over the years. So whenever the panic attacks will come, I just have to stop myself from panicking so I don't die because I won't be able to breathe and stuff, right? So, but this particular day, I couldn't coordinate myself because I was under the influence and heavily so. Um, it caused the ruckus at, at the house. And I remember the warning. I was taken to the balcony um, of the building and it took a while for me to sober up and I was still unable to breathe properly. That day, while after I got sober, I prayed that if God saved me from death, I would not drink again. And that was the last I touched alcohol. The near-death experience made me keep my word of not drinking. In hindsight, I think the Lord used that situation to bring me to the end of myself. I stopped hanging out with those friends. I shortly came to know the Lord after that incident, so I made my faith known to those friends. There was an incident when I had an attack, and okay, that was in 2022, so I had an, an attack, and this intense urge to drink, it was like, I felt like there was a spirit upon me, because it was like there was this strong desire to have a drink. And prior to that day, or two days before, I don't, I'm not sure of how long between the incident, but I had had a dream where I had seen a bottle of Hennessy in a cupboard in my house. Now, my parents don't drink, like I said, and you would not find alcohol in that kind of position, right? So as soon as I woke up from that dream, I actually went to the cupboard to find out, like, okay, is this my dream real? And I actually saw the Hennessy bottle there. <laughs> so I went to meet my parents and I was asking them, why is this Hennessy? Because I'd already told them about my drinking. I had confessed and said, I'd written a long thing and sent my parents about my drink, basically my life testimony. So I told them that why is there alcohol in the house? And they were like, they were giving the alcohol that didn't buy it. So they just kept it there. And I remember my dad had asked me if it's uncomfortable for me. So I said no, because it wasn't even my drink of choice. I didn't like it. I didn't like brown liquor. So, yeah. So when this intense urge came, it was a literal battle not to go drink it, even if it was not my drink of choice. But by God's grace, I ended up sleeping off, and that was how I won that one. It's been three years and some months, and I haven't had a single drop of alcohol or the desire to have it. A girl who disliked people who drank became the very thing she disliked. Why? Simply put, I took God out of my life and there was no basis for my principles and moral standards. So it was bound to shift and crumble eventually. I partied a lot, even to the extent of going to a strip club. I don't have to go into the details for you to understand, right? I moved from being a partaker to an instigator of a lifestyle of drinking and partying. I learned how to make, mix drinks. Just know I became a person I could have sworn I would not be. God had begun dealing with things in me before I eventually gave him my heart. And this was a major one. And I thank God for it. More will come in subsequent times. Amen. we pray.
hear that you speak your words into our hearts. Speak your words into our hearts as individuals. Speak your words into our hearts as a group of people. Speak your words into our hearts as a church. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may have your seats. Good evening, everybody. So, um, when I was told I'll be sharing this evening, I wondered what to share. But from the different testimonies, from Ifuro to the last person, I hope we noticed that the message was shared. Did we notice? Or you just thought they were just sharing their experiences? Hope we were able to pick the lessons peculiar to you from what was shared from the different people. So, basically, we've noticed that this season, as a church and as an individual, what we've been hearing has been centered on consecration. So, what I'll be doing basically is raise questions in your minds. What is the quality of life you want to live? First of all, what is the quality of life you want to live? Have you sat down to examine yourself? Have you sat down to make records and analyze your past and present and ask yourself certain questions? What is the quality of life you want to live? How much have you prepared? How much have you been prepared? How much are you preparing for the life you want to live? When I thought of this, the scenario that came to mind was, think, yourself, think about yourself right from primary school. There's a reason you started school from scratch, right? There's a reason our parents took us to school, from nursery school to primary school, from primary to secondary, and at secondary school, you were just eager. You, were, you couldn't wait to just write YAG and further your education, right? Go further into tertiary institution. You couldn't just wait. And when you got to the university, year one, year two, you're eager to leave. You see life progression. Meanwhile, there was a point where you felt like, if I could just get to university, I, I'll feel like I've arrived. But you get to realize that you never arrive, but you keep striving. You keep striving, you keep striving. And I thought of it. With your spirit man, how much have you striven? For your spirit man, how much have you striven? I remember the, um, a drama that was acted, I think about two years ago, the soul, body, and spirit drama, right? Can we remember? Yeah. That's one fascinating thing about drama. I want to join the drama team. I'm declaring it. So, you know how a message can be shared and you forget, but when a drama is presented before you, it sticks. So, you, if you can remember that drama precisely, I will not go into detail about what it was. We have it on our YouTube channel. You could, could um, look it up later. You see that depending on how much time that individual gave to her spiritual being, that determined how far, that, that determined how strong she was spiritually, right? But when the spirit man was neglected, of course, the soul prevailed. So I want us to ask ourselves, how much have you invested in your spirit man? 
let's quickly look at the book of um, Philippians chapter 3, from verse 7 to 10. But what, whatever was gained to me, I count as loss for the sake of Christ. More than that, I count all things as loss compared to the surpassing excellence of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being conformed to him in his death. Now you see Paul saying he counts all things as lost. He counts all things as lost. The Bible says that in as much as Christ suffered for you in the flesh, you should do what? You should also arm yourself likewise to suffer in the flesh for the sake of Christ. Now Paul said he counts everything as loss. For what? For the sake of Christ. If Rose said something, she said, nothing reveals the state of your heart like treasure. Nothing reveals the true state of your heart like treasure. How many of us, you've, you've been surprised at yourself? Like you shock your own self. You almost jumped out of yourself. But thank God that you don't have the power to do so. If not, you'll be jumping in and jumping out. Treasure brings out that which is really in you. What really is in you. Treasure brings it out. And personally, there are times... Um, have you been... Okay. A typical example is in the kitchen. Let me use this scenario. You, okay, just imagine, I'm not saying it's your kitchen, I'm not saying it's your neighbor's kitchen, I'm just using a kitchen, okay? So the kitchen where plates are not usually washed at night and everybody goes to sleep and some persons are hungry at night, they come out to find something for their stomach, those nocturnal beings, you know? And the light was put off and you step in and you turn on the light. Picture what you see. Picture what you see. You see different things, right? Cockroaches trying to take care of themselves after you had taken care of your own self. So when light comes, what happens? They go away. That's what happens when your life is all busy. You're busy with different things. You're Pressure is like light. When it comes, it reveals the things that are hidden in different corners. Remember, you're, you as an individual, you're a body made of many parts. And those different parts, the senses, your sense organs are like the get to your heart. And the gate welcomes the things that your spirit man wants and those the spirit man does not want. And this happens. Remember that foam illustration? How many of us remember the foam illustration during BBS? You should remember that foam that has been to different places. You've had many things, stones, sand, pins, unpleasant things embedded in that one form. That's the nature of the man's soul. And you come to God. It is pressure. It's when pressure comes on you that the true state, that who you are really is revealed to you. And God allows these things. God intentionally allows these things to happen. Jeremiah 18, Jeremiah chapter 18, someone could help me read. 
from verse 1 to 6. Okay? I'll read. This is the word that came to me. This is the word that came to Jeremiah from the Lord. Go down at once to the porter's house, and there I will reveal my message to you. So I went down to the porter's house and saw him walking on the wheel. But the vessel that he was shaping from the clay became flawed in his hand. Notice that the vessel became flawed in his hand. Some translation will say mud in his hand. So he formed it into another vessel. As it seemed best for him to do. Then the word of the Lord came to me saying, O house of Israel, declares the Lord, can I not treat you as this porter treats his clay? Just like clay in the porter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Verse 6. Okay, okay, thank you. I'm okay with verse 5. So you notice... We are the potter, right? We are the clay, right? And God is the potter, right? And see your life as on that potter's wheel. Think of the different times you've been on the wheel. Think of the, the different times you carried yourself away. Are you truly like the clay that would remain on the potter's wheel? Are you truly like that clay that would remain on the potter's wheel? While you're on the wheel, you go through different things. You go through pressure to be shaped into the person that God wants you to be. To be shaped into the vessel that God wants to make of you. But would you remain on that wheel? Remember, there's something I noticed. It said, sorry, verse 4 says, and the vessel that he made of clay was mad in his hand. Are there times where you feel like God is not with you? I mean, God cannot be with you and certain things are happening. There are times like that, right? Remember today that you're that clay on the wheel. You're that clay. You feel mad. You feel flawed. That doesn't mean God is not with you. And that's what happens to most people. At that moment where you feel mad, at that moment where you feel flawed, at that moment where you feel like you should progress, you, you compare yourself. Remember, they that compare themselves are not wise. You compare yourself with others. Others are progressing. Others are making it spiritually. Now, I'm not referring to um, um, canal progression spiritually but it seems yours you're just stagnant if only you will allow yourself remain on that potter's wheel those foolish acts you carried out that made you feel like that makes you feel like you're stagnant God can turn it out for good if only you will allow yourself Remain on that wheel. Even if you feel mad, even if you feel flawed, it doesn't mean God left you. We are the ones that leave God. We, we, we are the ones that take ourselves away from him. But if we draw near to him, he will do what? He will draw. Always remember that if you draw near to him, he will draw near to you. And as long as you live on earth, someone asked me this question, why is, why is life difficult? Why, why must things be hard? Why? Many whys. And I remember the illustration pastor gave. Sometimes we, we expect things to go well because we feel like this earth is our home, right? You feel like this earth is our home. We forget we are sojourners. We forget that this place is like a school. Where the devil is what? The compound master. 
This earth is a school. I mean, you've not heard it before. You've not heard it from pastor. This place is a school where the devil is the compound master. You don't expect him to be nice, except he's your father. You don't expect the devil to be nice with you. That's why that particular thing you think you had overcome, you thought, I mean, when pressure comes, it reveals the true state. It reveals where you are. It shows whether you've progressed or not. Count it all joy when you're tempted. When you face trials, count it all joy. Because it's from there that character is molded. It's from there that God molds you into the man. It's from there that God molds you into the woman he wants you to be. But unfortunately, what happens is, Hebrews 12, when you're disciplined, while you are on that wheel, while God is doing different things with you, you get bitter. The aspect of unforgiveness, I had different things written down. People that testified were just talking about the different things I wrote down already. Unforgiveness, you know, you know if someone hurts you, sometimes it's very annoying, it can be very annoying that you offend me and you don't know you offended me and I'm walking around and I'm not talking to you and you're living your life, you're very happy. You don't, you have no idea about what I'm going through and life goes on. I mean, why, I, why, would I, why would I be so wicked to myself? Why? It's the devil. Now, offense. There's an illustration that came to mind. Offense is... I wish I had some other thing to use. I would see offense as carrying this. This is light, right? This Bible is light, right? Okay. I'm carrying this offense. I'm not... It's not weighty. It's not affecting my hand at the moment. Imagine I carry this for an hour, two hours, three hours, one week, one month. Don't you think it will affect my arm? It will, right? But from the beginning, it seemed like nothing. Now, offense may be more weighty than this. But that's what happens when you carry offenses. God allows you to go through different things. God brings you across different people that will help shape you into the person God wants you to be. And it's either you... Hi. I'm just remembering myself. How you take pride in being offended. How you take pride in... I'm offended, therefore, I won't talk to you. Who are you, Steph? In fact, I don't even enjoy talking much. Therefore, I lose nothing. That level where I used to take pride in, do we have misunderstanding? Let's see you come and say sorry. But with time, growing in God, with the knowledge of God, you get to realize that's just foolishness. That's just, you're just carrying weight. You're just carrying burdens that are not necessary. You're just, you're hurting yourself. And if it continues, you get to realize that that arm will be disfigured in some way. That's what happens to our hearts. That's what happens to our hearts. Where people look at you and they cannot recognize you. People that, I mean, you had, you came together, you knew God together, you, you had this knowledge, this refreshment, this, this love for God, this passion. But because something happened and you were offended, like that's what, what our sister shared. I mean, she had a certain level of the knowledge of God. But because, see people that are not even as righteous as I am, baptized in the Holy Ghost, and here I am. God is not being fair. Ah, thank God for knowledge. If, if, if not for knowledge, someone like me, I would have been far gone because I've not shaken before. I'm always, even everybody is, I have to intentionally speak in the Spirit, pray in the Spirit, I have to 
believe that me, I too am experiencing what everybody is experiencing. Those that have gone far, I too. The most that can happen to me is okay, I'll cry, you know. So imagine that I pick offense at God. Ah, to be offended at God. No, now. To be offended at God. You're hurting your own self. Because God remains God, no matter what. Like, no matter what. But, however, whatever he puts us through, whatever process he puts us through, we know it's for our good. He's the wise God. He's the all-knowing God. Still on the matter of consecration, we we'll look at um, let's look at the life of Daniel. Daniel one, verse five to seven. Daniel chapter one. The king assigned them daily provisions of the royal food and wine. They were to be trained for three years, after which they were to enter the king's service. Among these young men were some from Judah, Daniel, Ananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he gave, he gave the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's food or wine. So he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself. My, I liked it the way my translation puts it. He said, Daniel proposed in his heart. Daniel proposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies. This is still the season of consecration where you should sit down and examine your relationship with God. Examine your life with God. What have you proposed in your heart? Like Paul would say, he counts all things as loss. For what? For the sake of Christ. If you keep on reading, you hear him say that he may attain the resurrection. Daniel proposed in his heart. And if you see the life of Daniel, you see how God used him. Look at his life with um, King Nebuchadnezzar. I mean, it's normal for someone to have a dream. It's normal that you tell the dream you had, right? What's normal about having a dream? You will not tell the dream and you're seeking for the interpretation. But Daniel was able to do this. Why? Because he purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Sometimes we think, we may think that defilement comes when, okay, we get home and our parents decide to take us to places we shouldn't be, to shrine-like places, to, I mean, general places we know we shouldn't be, right? But, unfortunately, fortunately and unfortunately, we are usually faced with situations where we either defile ourselves or not. On a daily basis, God presents us situations where it's either we are, we are going to defile ourselves or not. And if you have eyes to see these situations, it would to really help a long way. What have you proposed in your heart this beginning of the year? What have you purposed in your heart? The things you've purposed in your heart will determine the quality of relationship you have with God. It's God that knows those who are truly his. What have you purposed in your heart for the sake of Christ? What have you purposed in your heart? All right, please give me that same Daniel 2, verse 27 and 28. Verse 27 and 28. 
Daniel answered the king, no wise man, encounter, medium, or magician can explain to the king the mystery which he inquires. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will happen in the latter days. Your dream and visions that came into your mind as you lay on your bed were these. I won't go into the details of the dream. But Daniel was able to give the king the interpretation of the dream. How did he get to that point? Was it from the place of living a reckless life? It was from the place of living a consecrated life. It was from the place of consecration. The mere fact that you're here, you're here for a purpose. The mere fact that you're here, God has a plan that he wants to use you for. But would you be willing to consecrate your life in order for that plan to be fulfilled? There are instances where you go out for evangelism and you get to talk to people. And you're fascinated at how much God can use you. You're fascinated at how much God can reveal certain things to you, right? Right? But you know there are more to that. Whatever you've experienced so far, whatever encounters you've had, whatever experience you've had, you cannot, you cannot have enough of the best of God. You cannot get to the point where you tell yourself you've had enough of him. You cannot have enough of the best. It begins from the place of consecration. It begins from the place of consecration. Imagine our pastor did not consecrate himself. Where would I be by now? Just think about it. Think of it. Some of us would have been in weird places. Who knows? Maybe some people still clubbing and different things by now. Only God knows the number of abortions by now. Only God knows the number of husbands, the number of wives, the number of different things. It's in the place of being consecrated. It's in the place of consecration that God can use you to save a nation. But the thing is that you may not know how far he will take you. Not you may not know. You will not know how far he will take you until you're willing to purpose in your heart. Until you're willing to purpose in your heart that you will not defile yourself no matter what. So see yourself as that, see yourself as that clear. See yourself as that clay that will not, that will not leave the potter's wheel. No matter the heat. Because if it is heat, it will come. If it is pressure, it will come. You know how you look at some people and it seems like they don't have problems. Sister Jenna testified, when was that? Some days back. And she shared her fears, right? Did you hear her share her fears? Would you look at Sister Jenna and you don't feel like, I mean, she doesn't have issues. She's so devoted. But when people come out and share their fears, you feel like we're in this earth realm together. <laughs> They're just feeling like we're in this earth realm together. If you're doing it, I too can do it. So the heat will come. The storms will come. Definitely it will come. As long as you're in this planet Earth. Especially if you ever aim to live righteously. You suffer persecution. You suffer persecution from families, from friends. You feel persecuted by yourself. You feel like you are persecuting your own self. There are times you feel like, why am I so stupid? 
You look at, if you've not felt like that before, don't worry. If you continue obeying God, you feel that feeling will come. I'm not referring to the feeling where you, I'm not, I'm not referring to when that feeling comes because you're in disobedience. I'm referring to when that feeling comes because you're in obedience to God. When you feel, what am I? You look at people, when you, when you look at people around you, look at your classmates, you feel stupid. But it's good that you're feeling stupid for the sake of God. Let it be for the sake of Christ though. Because in feeling stupid, you still feel stupid. <laughs> you know how you feel like those fine girls in the world, they're enjoying themselves, they don't have issues. It's because they've not spoken to you. They've not talked to you. They've not told you the fears. They've not told you that they've gotten to the point where they tell themselves, I just want to survive no matter what. But what are they surviving for? The difference is they just want to survive. What are they surviving for? But at least you know you have that hope. That hope that keeps you going. Living a hopeless life, I used to wonder how people survive without the knowledge of God. Like, I just used to wonder. Because there are times I feel so... I'm like, what's really in this life? If I don't have the knowledge of God, probably I would have... If I don't have the knowledge of the resurrection of the dead, ah, that you give account that a time will come where you'll be rewarded for every good thing you've done. Maybe I would have committed suicide by now. But it is that hope that keeps you going. It's that hope that keeps you going. 1 Corinthians 15. If there was no resurrection of the dead, we of all men would have been most miserable. Christians of all men would have been most miserable. And unfortunately, in this same Christendom, there are Christians that do not even know why they are Christians. And it feels very pathetic. There are Christians that do not know why they are Christians. There are Christians that feel like everyone lives, live your life. So you see some person just live their lives and they want to make everything they can here. They want to achieve all they can here. Why? Because life begins here and ends here. Would you blame them for the level of knowledge they have? Yes, to some extent. But to whom much is given, much is what? <laughs> to whom much is given, much is expected. You have the, you've had the knowledge of the resurrection of the dead. For those that have gone to the, through the believers' classes. And that gives you hope. And it is the hope that will keep you going. All right, um, quickly, we'll look at Romans 12. Scripture very familiar to us. Romans 12, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers, on account of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Do not be conformed to this world. It's very easy to conform. How many of us have realized that it's very easy to conform? Conform. It's, it's easier when you're amongst people that are not conforming. You feel like a spiritual giant. Until you find yourself in the midst of people that everyone is, you're the, you're the weirdo. You're the weird person. You're the weird fellow. Just because... 
you don't want to conform. Conforming could be in the way you dress. Conforming could be in the way you talk. In different areas. Conforming could be in the people you honor. The people you esteem. Esteeming those that are due your esteem. I can remember some months ago, I... I dressed a certain way. I was I was dressed a certain way, not in the sense, very decent. And the people around me began to mock me for me being properly dressed. Now, you know your work with God covers every area of your life, right? Your work with God covers every area of your life. It reflects in how you talk. It, it reflects in how you dress. It reflects in everything you do. And it's quite, it's quite unfortunate. Yes, it's unfortunate for us how, how the people of the world are so bold. And I mean, of us, you've been ashamed of the gospel of Christ in some way before. It has happened that you've expressed some form of shame for the gospel of Christ. I remember when I was in secondary school. Ah, the devil has its angels. I remember when I was in secondary school. I've always been this person to myself, kind of person. So I had this classmate. She was very bold. I mean, we were together in primary school and we happened to be in the same secondary school. She's outspoken. She's... She's bold. She's, she'll, she'll tell you what you want to hear and what you don't want to hear. So she would, okay, that as a then, um, what do they call that phone? Blackberry. That was the trending phone then. And she had that phone. And I didn't know what they used to watch. I didn't know she, she used to bring the phone to school and my classmates would gather and they would watch porn together. And she do it boldly and freely. I didn't know until the day she came to me, she said, I used to try to mind my business a lot. She said, I told her, I beg, leave me. She said, you see what we are watching, you must watch it today. She not said verbally, she came and dragged me. Say you must, okay, I just followed her so that there'll be peace. Only for me to go and look at the screen and what I saw was that they are watching porn openly. And sometimes, sometimes that scenario comes to mind. And I'm like, can you? She's like the angel of the dark. And she's working so well. How much have you done for the sake of Christ? How much, how many people have you dragged for the sake of Christ? How many people? Have you given up on? So I beg. Someone was talking to me today and she was like, maybe you have the calling of a pastor. <laughs> and I looked at myself and laughed at how impatient I am. That, hey, did you say pastor? Like me, pastor. You know how someone talks to you and first of all, you set your heart. Now, if, if you talk to me, I search my heart and I don't try to let be what I'm not. I tell you it's not there, it's not there. Maybe God will put it in later. But you see how these people are and you look at us. I'm not saying you should. Yes, there's righteous competition. Look at us, how much have you done? I want you to feel spurred up. I want you to feel angered to want to desire more, to want more, to want to bring more, more people for the kingdom of God. 
Because the world is not ashamed of what they do. The world is not ashamed of what they can do. And the world is not ashamed of what they will do. Matthew 10, that memory verse, therefore whoever confesses me before, can we have it on? Or let's sing it. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, he my will also confess before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, he my will also deny before my Father who is in heaven. Therefore, whoever confesses me before men, so confess before my father who is in heaven but whoever denies me before men he my will also deny before my father who is in heaven now there are memory verses we sing and sometimes i naturally i think of what i'm saying and i'm scared Therefore, whoever confesses me before me, him I will also confess before my father who is in heaven. Whatever denies me before me, him I will deny before my father who is in heaven. We've denied him in many ways. We've denied him in our words. We've denied him in our actions. We've denied him in our inactions. How do I know? I am included. And these are the different ways we examine ourselves. Is it amongst us? We deny him when we see a brother or a sister do what she's not supposed to do. And we keep quiet. I appreciate it when people rebuke me. I may not show the appreciation, but my spirit man does. Some people are looking at me like, are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. My spirit man does. My soul may not show the appreciation, but my spirit man does. And I remember, I remember I was with a member man and I said something very stupid. And the way he entered, enter, that's not English. The, <laughs> the way we, he entered me, we understand. The way he rebuked me. I was begging him, I've, I've received the rebuke, now it's okay. I, you, know, you, know, you know how a brother rebukes you and you're wishing he was not there when you made that statement? I, I, I was, in my mind, I, I just wished most people were like that. I wished I was like that as a person. I don't see, you know how, we come from different places. You know how out of the abundance of your heart, you, funny enough, you don't, we don't even know this abundance. We don't know this abundance because we come from different places. We come, God brought us from different places. Sometimes we don't even remember some of our life testimonies. We don't remember the details of our life testimonies. God brings us from different places. And despite the fact that he has brought us home, circumstances, pressure comes. And then those things that were still there begin to spring out. And if only you're with people that understand what family is, they would help you get rid of those things faster. And this brother rebuked me and it was a Sunday morning. He talked and talked and talked. And when I see him, I want to avoid him. I, if I see him, I'll just smile and want to take the other way. But it, it's not like that. Not that I want to take the other way in the sense that he, he will do it again. He will rebuke me again. But... I made it known to him, yes, I've gotten the point, I've gotten the rebuke. If, if we were brothers and sisters keepers like that, most of us will grow faster, will grow in different ways. You, you find yourself this to be this diligent person. You find yourself to be this person that you cannot tame the tongue because it is from the abundance of the heart that the, the tongue gives it out. The tongue gives what is there. It's not its fault. It's the state of the heart. If we would judge ourselves, we will not be judged. 
But when we are judged, we are chastened by the Lord, that we may not be condemned with the world. You see different levels of judgment. We judge ourselves. God judges us, or we are judged with the world. We are judged alongside with the world. Let's judge ourselves. That brother or sister may just be trying to complete a quota of talk for the day, and the person is just uttering things he or she is not supposed to. You know how you rebuke in love? You know how you rebuke in love? I remember another scenario. I was with Sister Ibim. <laughs> so I'm sharing this because she actually shared it with some set of persons. She, okay, there was a dress she wore and it wasn't really okay. And I, I didn't really know how to put it. You know, I'm a shy person naturally. So, I didn't really know how to put it. So I, I went to her, I told her some of the flaws in the dress, and she was very happy. She was, she was very happy that I felt proud of myself that I corrected her. And when she talked about it, she said I corrected her in love. I not go, I not go all. I can't even remember how I did it. But it was gentle, it was subtle. Now, there are people that do not need that gentle rebukes. You know, you're getting, get wisdom. And there are people you rebuke gently. So what's the essence of all these um, different experiences I'm sharing? If we help ourselves, if we know that we are responsible for each other, it will help us grow as a house. A threefold cord is not easily broken. It can be broken, but not easily broken. So what, what happens when it's just an individual? What happens when it's just two persons? What happens when it's a threefold cord? For it to be broken is would be more difficult. Let's grow in love. Let's grow in unity. Let's grow together. Let's be there for each other. Let's rid ourselves of offenses. Because eventually it leads to a bitter root that does what? defiles many. It defiles many in the sense that you could get, get defiled. You don't know if I was looking up to you. You don't know if I was if you were the only reason I was I was still coming. You know people look up to you, you don't know. You know, right? People look up to you, but you don't know. I mean, this is like people are always looking for, no matter the shenanigans, people pull. People are always looking for who to look up to. They won't show it. Now remember, you're not the one that convicts people of it's the Holy Spirit that does his work. The Holy Spirit will convict men of sin, righteousness, and judgment at the right time. But you don't know if you're the person they're looking up to. And then you just pull one stunt and they're like, oh, if you could, who am I? Here we die. We roll in the mud together. So please, let's grow together. Let's, let's be the set of persons who are able to build ourselves together and not take delight in the fall of any. Ah, I don't know if you've, pastor said something. If, if at any point, you felt delighted at the fall of a brother or a sister. It should really search your heart. There wasn't that there was an 
iota of delight at the fall of a brother or sister. You should really check your heart. Because when that pressure comes, it will reveal the true state of your heart. When you don't judge yourself, when that pressure comes, it will show what was really there. Let's judge ourselves so that we'll not be judged. However, even when we are judged, let's know that we are being chastened by the Lord so that we may not be, we may not be condemned with the world. Let's be that clay with the knowledge that no matter what you, fe you face, no matter what you're going through, no matter what happens, that what, even, if, even when you feel mad that you're in the potter's will, and the potter is your maker, and the potter is your God. And it's in the place of consecration, it's in the place of setting yourself apart that you'll be able to allow yourself to remain on that wheel. Okay, this song is just coming to mind and I feel we should just sing it. Lord, make us living sacrifices. Please, um, DMT, sing it or something, I'll spoil it for you. To offer up your incense, to offer up your praise. Lord, make us living sacrifices. To offer up your incense. It's a prayer. To offer up your praise. So we pray, Lord, make us living sacrifices. Oh, to offer up your incense. To offer up your praise. To 
It's in the place of consecration. It's in the place of consecration that he makes living sacrifices out of us. a living sacrifice in the past. If you've not been consecrated in the past, set apart for him. It's an opportunity. It doesn't matter how long you've been born again. Lord, make to offer yourself as a living sacrifice an offering you are but sometimes we forget that we are offerings we put ourselves on the altar and bring it down as we please with ourselves. moment and talk to God about the different areas of your life that you know have not been surrendered talk to God do not be compelled if you do not really want to make your life a living sacrifice
of us, our hearts have been hardened in layers. But he's able to give you the heart of flesh. name we pray. Father, we pray that you make us living sacrifices holy and acceptable unto you. In Jesus' name. Amen. So, so today was the Bible study and are there questions? All right. In the absence of questions, Brother Bernard, please come and take over. Don't worry, I'm not about to preach, okay? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Sister Sobo had told me that I have to do this. And I said, let her do she have the grace, but she insisted. So let's rest off it. We are closing. I know some people are shocked, like, what's going on in God's Lighthouse? <laughs> By past seven, so impossible. Some some people, when you get to that, they ask you, ah, what happened? They're chasing for you. It's very it's very possible, you know. So, um, some some some, I think that was 2021 where we had such an incident. This is a, this is supposed to be an incident. I mean, the leaders were on retreat, or yeah, they didn't come. So, I'm just recalling that we're talking about holiness. No, they had a long meeting downstairs at Gamka, and so they came late. Just about this time, that was when Pastor, you know, came up. And I recall I was, I had to share that day, uh, talking about holiness and waiting on the Lord. And I was talking about that with regards, just seeking the Lord. And then Pastor came, speaking about the same thing. He, he, he had to show me his tab, that it was the same thing that was on his tab. And the angle he came from was the fact that waiting on the Lord required serving the Lord. So... We have closed. But then, if you know you still need to talk to the Lord about some things. Because why, why, should, why and your sister was talking, why I was praying, and something just kept coming to mind. And I felt the need to, to you know, talk to the Lord about this thing. So, if you need the Lord to search you more and more, you can go home and continue that. So, we'll take our um, offering now. And if you're, if you're here for the first time, just you come to me when we are done praying. So that we, you know, we can just pray for you and then we dismiss. I mean, some people are still wondering, like, is this really true? It's true, very true. All right, so well, the basket will be by the door and at some strategic point. So you can just put in your offering or make a transfer to the account. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to give. We ask that as we give, it will be useful to your kingdom, oh God. And to those who do not have, Lord, we ask that you would provide for us. Not just finance alone, provision, food, clothing, and what is needed. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray.